first part of lesson four for our study of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. Turn our attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When you have the opportunity, I want to encourage you to read the 12th chapter, maybe before next week when we come back together, if the Lord lets us live and enables us to do so. Uh, spend some time reviewing the entire 12th chapter because these 31 verses are the ones that I will be referring to in part, not all of them, but in part in bringing out our lesson dealing with the gifts of the Spirit. I lead off tonight by saying that Gifts are very, very special to every one of us whenever we receive them. Special occasions occur, uh, birthdays, anniversaries, different things like that. Christmas, of course, we think about uh, giving and receiving gifts. And I think all of us are well aware of how our hearts are moved with expressions of gratitude and thanks for of what others do for us. And we're also thankful for what we're able to do for others as God provides for us. God, however, has given us the greatest of all gifts, has he not? Amen. His son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest gift. And he alone is able to meet the spiritual needs of every man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of the earth. Nobody else can meet the needs of people like he can. But God, in his infinite wisdom, God the Father and God the Son, saw fit to give another gift to every single person born into the family of God, and that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And as I shared in the first lesson, what a very special, special person he is. Even as we shared a couple of weeks ago about him coming into our hearts and uh, abiding in our lives, how wonderful that is. What a special gift we have to have the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. I would say of, of him being in our lives that he completes the package, doesn't he? He just makes it all come together. For in Him is found every single thing that every child of God needs for life, for ministry, for the establishment, and uh, for the development of a consistent testimony that is being lived out for the Lord each and every day. So in addition to all that we have already talked about thus far in this brief series on the Holy Spirit, I want us to realize that one of the many things that he does for us is endow us with special gifts so that we can function as God wishes for us to function in our lives, doing ministry and work for him. Now there's a key point that we need to remember and that key point is that the gifts of the Spirit are always for the purpose of honoring God Himself. Always. Please don't ever forget that. I know that I'm speaking to the choir here, but it seems that some people maybe forget that. The gifts that are endowed upon individuals by the Holy Spirit are never given to glorify the individual. Never, ever. They are always given to glorify God. And so I emphasize that point because of its tremendous importance in understanding the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Then we notice what Paul begins to give us in the way of instructions as he says in verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. 
I want you to understand is what he's saying. And I want you to understand with clarity why you are gifted by the Holy Spirit with spiritual gifts as he was addressing the Christians in the church there at Corinth at this particular time. He says of them, ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. And then he begins going further into this thing and talking about uh, <coughs> true ministry being the exercise of uh, the spiritual gifts that are given to <coughs> us by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> first point that I make with us tonight following the uh, key point that I hope you will always remember is that the gifts of the Spirit are very diversified. Very diversified. In verse 4 he says, now there are diversities of gifts. And here's something interesting that I want you to see just real quickly a sidebar so to speak here. But in verses 4, 5, 6, down to the end of verse 6, we have the Trinity represented. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Paul was moved by the Holy Spirit to pen these words in this way so that full credit could be given where credit was due to give glory to God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. So he said, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. That's talking about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. That's talking about the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. And there are diversities of operations, but... It is the same God which worketh all in all. There's God the Father. You have all three personages right there in those three verses as he begins to talk about the diversification of the gifts that are given. Starting with verse 8, going down through verse 10, he gives nine spiritual gifts. He names them. Verse 8, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Now you can check these off if you want. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another diverse kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. There's nine that are mentioned right there in the context of this passage of Scripture. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and He divides to every man as He wills as it is in the will of God for him to do so. These gifts are given to different individuals. <clears throat> However, some may exercise more than one. They may be gifted in more than one way by the Holy Spirit. These are not natural gifts that a person is born with as far as their earthly birth is concerned. These are spiritual gifts. They are not developed from the good that is within a person. They are implanted from without by the hand and power of the Holy Spirit of God as He works in our hearts after we are saved by the wonderful grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, the gifts of the Spirit are sovereignly bestowed. 
we find that in verse 11 that I just read here. Now, to help us understand that, let me put it this way. The Holy Spirit reigns supremely, fulfilling the will of God the Father as He, the Holy Spirit, divideth to every man severally as He will. All a part of the plan of God, as He says there in verse 11. God the Father, God the Son, give the power, if you will, if I could put it this way, to God the Holy Spirit to place those gifts out and bestow them on whomsoever He the Holy Spirit believes is the right person for a certain gift or certain gifts to be bestowed upon. Now, according to what Paul said to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 22, the building up of the church is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what He does. He builds up the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, He and He alone knows best upon who to bestow particular gifts, one or more. He knows who can handle those gifts and use those gifts in accord with fulfilling the plan of God through their life. Now, every single one of us must submit to the will of the Holy Spirit so that we can be best fitted and fashioned to fulfill what God's plan is through our lives as we live it for Him. We must be in submission to the work of the Holy Spirit as He works within. He knows what we can each do. He knows how best to bestow upon us the gift that will enable us to give God the greatest degree of honor through the life that we live here upon this earth. It's amazing. We don't, we don't do that. Uh, I didn't choose to be a preacher of the gospel. He chose me. I'd say Brother Julius didn't choose that either. He knows that he was chosen of the Lord and gifted by the Holy Spirit with the gift to be able to preach the Word. If you would have known me in my early days, uh, I didn't even want to stand up in front of the classroom and give an oral book report. I hated that with a passion. Uh, every time it came around, that was a hard thing for me to have to do. And then whenever I reached the point of knowing that the hand of God was upon my life, I'm thinking, how is this going to work? God has His ways of gifting us. As I've heard other preachers say, God knows what we can do. Putting it in my words, He knows what we can do. He's sovereign. He's our Creator. He knows what we are, what we can do, and how we can do whatever it is that He wishes for us to do to bring Him the greatest honor. Like I said a few minutes ago while we're living our lives, therefore, He knows what gifts to bestow upon us or what gift in order for that honor to be given to Him through our lives. We have to be submitted to the will of God to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I had to submit, as I've told you before, and give my life in full surrender to the voice of the Holy Spirit as He spoke to me that night. Thirdly, the gifts of the Spirit are for the profit of all. Everyone profits in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ when our gifts are used as they are supposed to be used by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. 
Every believer ought to be a profitable member of the body of Christ. After all, that's why the presence of the Holy Spirit is given to us. That's why he lives within our hearts and lives so that we will contribute in a profitable way to the work and ministry uh, of winning people to the Lord Jesus Christ. I would put it this way, the church collectively and its members individually profit from the diverse gifts that are identified within the body of Christ. Don't we profit by those that God has gifted to be able to teach in our midst, teach Sunday school lessons and so forth? Uh, sure. Don't we profit from those that have been gifted with musical talent? Didn't we profit Sunday morning from the musical talent of, of our wonderful uh, music crew here? Amen. I just thought Sunday morning was extraordinarily <clears throat> wonderful. I don't know what you thought, but everybody seemed like they were excited about being here and then they were excited about singing together. I thought the choir sounded so good. Larry did such a good job. Scott and Irene playing the instruments and everybody singing and then the congregation followed right up on that. I just thought it was fantastic. And uh, you know, Sister Irene sitting over there playing that piano like she does, that's a gift. Scott playing the instrument like, or instruments like he does, that's a gift. That's gifting from the Lord. Brother James teaching as he does, gifting from the Lord. Those gifts are given so that we all profit. Brother Julius in sharing, as he shares with us and shares with you in my absence, uh, as he did recently, gifted to be able to do that. Um, sharing as we're sharing tonight, hopefully profits all of us to have our attention drawn to these things that we're looking at here in this passage of scripture. So the gifts of the spirit are for the profit of all. Finally, the fourth point that I make tonight takes us all the way down to the last verse, but now there's more things that we'll pick up in, our, in the second part of our lesson uh, as we talk about the gifts of the Spirit. But I want you to know that the gifts of the Spirit are to be earnestly desired. Now listen carefully to this verse of Scripture. I don't know if you've ever read this verse and let it uh, speak to your heart the way I'm going to explain it to you tonight or not. But notice this, he says, but covet earnestly the best gifts. Is it wrong for an individual to want to have a special gift? Not wrong. Brother Julius said it right. It is not wrong. It is not wrong. Now, there might be a lot of people that would say, now, wait a minute, Pastor, you're way out on a limb right here. You might get that thing cut off behind you. No, I don't think so. I don't believe that at all. It is not wrong to desire to be gifted, to be a vessel suitable for doing the Lord's work and ministry. But he went on to say, and yet I show you a more excellent way which comes about as he unfolds what he begins to talk about in chapter 13, and he gets into the great love chapter and talks about the benefit of love. And all of us being gifted to love one another, and we're to show brotherly love and so forth one toward the other. But let's back up to that first phrase that we find there in verse 31. And it's on your outline, I believe. It is not a sin to desire being endowed with a spiritual gift that will be used solely to bring honor and glory unto the Lord. For anybody that wants to be gifted <clears throat> to honor the Lord with their life, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <clears throat> Whenever I was 
young and growing up, I got involved in music, of course, as you know. Uh, never did develop uh, a lot of skill. Uh, basically just strumming the guitar and playing along with others who were playing the lead role and so forth. But back in those days, I loved to sing. And I really, truly was convinced in those days that singing and playing music was God's gift for my life at that time. And that remained true all the way up until the night I surrendered to preach the gospel. And while I've been able to sing since then intermittently and make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all of the attention for me has shifted from the music over to the preaching and the teaching of God's Word because that's how God gifted me from that point going forward, growing me and developing me in the Word of the Lord and still He's the potter and I'm the clay tonight. He's still working on me and he's still molding me and he's still teaching me each and every day that I live. Now, in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, Paul mentions the gift of prophesying as one to be desired. Listen to what he says here, chapter 14, verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, Here's our word again, covet. That means to desire. Covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Covet to prophesy. That's a gift to be desired. In my early days, I had the privilege to teach in the church where I was growing up in. I taught Sunday night Bible school. Uh, study every single week. Uh, that was our service on Sunday night. We had, had in-depth Bible study. And that was my first exposure to studying the Word of God and to teaching the Word of God in that setting. And then as things would, would work out for me, uh, Dad, on one occasion, I may have told you this before, but he on one occasion was in contact with a pulpit committee with the church over in uh, Alexander County. And uh, um, they were talking with him about coming and doing a trial sermon. They scheduled the date and so forth. And uh, Dad had an accident at work and he was not able to go. He was hospitalized. The chairman of the search committee called him, I think it was on Saturday and said, uh, we're looking for you to be here tomorrow, whatever day it was, whichever day it was that they were talking. And dad said, well, I'm not gonna be able to be there. Unfortunately, I'm in the hospital. And the guy said, well, do you have anybody that you can, uh, give us the name of that could come and fill in for you and speak for you because we don't have anybody else to fill in. Dad did me a favor. He said, my son can do it. <laughs> Rosalie and I were dating. So that Sunday morning, I picked her up at her house and we went to that church and I filled in for my dad. <laughs> Didn't know what I was going to be headed toward uh, some years later. But I wanted to do a good job and I wanted to teach the Word of God and I wanted to present the Word of God. I had a desire in my heart to do that. And then the Lord called. Um, the prophesying that Paul is talking about here in verse 39 is talking of one or referring to one who preaches or explains Scripture. If you go back and read verses 22 through 25, he gives an explanation of that, why that is the case. What we need to realize tonight, beloved, is that the unlearned and the unbelieving need to be convinced and converted 
And how are they going to experience that unless they have a preacher? It takes a preacher empowered and gifted by the Holy Spirit to preach the Word in such a way as to allow the Holy Spirit to take that preached Word and touch and quicken and challenge the heart. The believing, on the other hand, need to learn scriptural doctrine so they will bear testimony of it in order for God to be glorified. Therefore, it's a good thing to desire the ministry of prophesying. Um, that's not talking about, by the way, in today's environment, that's not talking about me being a prophet, for example, or Brother Julius being a prophet of the Lord in this day in which we live as it relates to those who were prophets in the Old Testament. Prophets are foretellers. They foretell the future. Those of us who are involved in the ministry of prophesying, as Brother Julius and I are, and gifted by the Holy Spirit to do that, are foretellers. We're telling what's there in the Scripture. And we're striving to explain what is there on the written page so that it will be easily understood. We couldn't do that without the gifting of the Holy Spirit. Could not do it. I'm grateful for His gifting. Father, thank you for our time together tonight, first part of this lesson, and I pray that we will take home that which we have talked about, that we'll meditate upon it, study it, reflect upon it, and have our uh, spirits really, really strengthened and encouraged as we seek to utilize the ways in which you have gifted each of us to bring you honor and glory. May we do it to the very best of our ability, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.